threatened my husband with divorce over another woman's lies. Now he's gone. How do I fix this? I, a 28-year-old female, threatened my husband, a 30-year-old male, with divorce over another woman's lies. How can I fix this? My husband and I have been together for six years and married for four, with two kids, a three-year-old and a one-year-old girl. My husband is everything to me. He's amazing in every way. And I couldn't possibly ask for a better husband and father for our daughters and future children. I love this man more than anything, and my absolute worst fear is losing him. He works at an office job but also occasionally teaches a weekend morning yoga meditation class at the gym he goes to. Two months ago, a woman who is a fitness influencer with a following of about 20,000 recently started regularly attending his classes and asked to take a selfie, saying that she wanted to give my husband and the gym a shout out for organizing the yoga classes. She took three selfies of the two of them, and in the last one, she randomly kissed my husband on the cheek. My husband made it clear that he had no interest in her. He told me what happened that very day, and he never followed her back or gave her his phone number. I felt thankful and happy that my husband was honest and upfront with me about someone else testing the waters with him and him shutting her down. A few days later, this woman somehow found my social media and requested to follow me, which I denied. I kept a close eye on her social media for a little while, and a few days after that, she changed her profile picture to one of the selfies of her and my husband. I randomly showed up to my husband's yoga class the next week, and afterwards, I gave her a piece of my mind to leave my husband and me alone. Her profile picture went back to what it was before, and I thought that was the end of it. So I kept showing up at my husband's yoga classes, and she was always there too. She tried to make small talk, but I mostly ignored her until she eventually apologized and admitted that she was out of line. Over the next few weeks, we became somewhat friends, despite my husband telling me not to get close with or trust her. Over this past weekend, I got a text from her telling me that she felt guilty about hiding the truth and sent me several screen recordings of messages between her and my husband talking badly about me, the lies he would tell me, plans to hook up, etc. It all seemed real, and there was no way I could have known it was all fake, especially since she had been very friendly to me the past few weeks. I confronted my husband. He denied it all, but I didn't believe him. I accused him of deleting the messages from his phone. I said terrible things to him and told him to leave our home and never speak to me again. I told him that we were done, that I would be filing for divorce, and that he would never see our daughters again. I got on a call with her to get all the details and caught her in a lie. I pressed her about it, and she confessed it was all a lie and broke down, admitting she just wanted my husband. I immediately called my husband, begged him to come home and apologized for everything I did and said to him today. He came home after work, played with our daughters for a while, and left again once they were in bed. He's been ignoring me almost completely, and he's fully right to do so. I know I made several mistakes, becoming her friend despite my husband telling me not to, trusting her screen recordings, not trusting my husband's love and loyalty to me, and kicking him out of our home. It's all my fault. I cried myself to sleep last night, and tonight won't be any different. I can't do this without him. He's my everything, and I feel like I've lost him. I know he'll be back tomorrow after work, and that'll be my best chance to try talking and apologizing to him. What can I do to fix this and earn my husband's trust back? I've thought of everything, from writing him a letter telling him how sorry I am and how much I love and admire him, to forcing a hug, cooking his favorite dish, or suggesting some sort of counseling for us, but I don't know exactly what to do. Story 2 I am a worker bee in a company that got bought out by a much bigger company earlier this year. Even though we were a small company, the teams were flexible, and everyone helped each other, and the company was profitable. Not to the new ownership though. Apparently our company was crap, and needed to be immediately fixed with structure, hierarchy, and order. The managers I've worked so well with over the years are gone. The new owners promise no change, nothing to worry about, everything will be the same. Except that within a month, all the experienced managers who made the workplace so great to work for are let go. What is worse, they've been replaced by emotionless walking husks resembling ghosts, with hammers as their only tool, and we're all nails. Never mind the incessant preaching of company spirit and loyalty and respect and company values. We all moan at these pep talks. We all yawn at the town halls. Then the less subtle threats. Oh, you're not a team player if you don't do X, Y, and Z. You need to work OT, or else that's not fair to everyone else. You're leaving on time, again. The culture certainly has changed. For one, I didn't even dare to take off early to pick up my kids from school anymore. Finally, the toxic culture of fear and backstabbing. Every word said against the direction. 
Even off the cuff in a chit-chat, and every little facial or non-verbal gesture against the flow are immediately and harshly met with reprimands. For example, another worker B was recently let go for restructuring, despite stellar work performance. He just couldn't keep his thoughts to himself I guess. I hope I painted a good picture of what life under the iron fist is like. Many of us are contemplating of leaving, but the job market is quite depressing in our area. The cost of living is high, and we are afraid of being the neck that sticks out. So everyone suffers in silence. The company recently appointed a new CEO who, in his opening introduction to everyone, demanded undivided loyalty to him. It means we must follow his every direction. It means we must smile in his presence and be super upbeat. I think the expectation here is we must cry like North Korean women in the presence of the supreme leader Kim Jong-un. You want us absolute loyalty. I believe loyalty goes both ways. But we can show you loyalty. We all got the message. You want us to play Oscar-winning actors and actresses instead of actually getting work done and speaking our minds to make the company better. You got it. For those of us who read and trust each other, but we still need to be careful, we would have hours-long meetings with each other on topics that sound important, but don't actually matter. We make sure our days are jammed-packed full of discussions on how to move initiatives forward but never actually discuss anything of substance and never have aggressive action items to follow up on. We absolutely never forget to praise the leadership in the meeting minutes. Off the books, though, there's lots of small talks for the sake of team building. Whenever we're questioned by these husks of a ghost, we'd pull out the corporate roadmap and point to the initiatives we've spent so many hours working on. We'd defend our time with the budget that recently got rolled out, look we're on side. We've gone so far as requesting additional resources in next year's budget to ensure our very busy initiatives continue to make headway. We're basically creating a public perception of busy without actually doing too much. We were a lean small company. Now we're a fat, busybody where everything is bloated and compartmentalized. We shut our faces and we nodded. We clapped the hardest after every presidential speeches. And we lost money in the last several months. That's the price we pay to give one-sided loyalty. We're still looking for other jobs. Story 3. This is gonna be a long one. TLDR at the end. This could also go in a my the idiot sub. You guys decide. Names have been changed to keep anonymity. Mobile phones became common in my country around 2004, just as I finished high school. My parents bought me my first phone, a second-hand Nokia. It was bulky and basic, but I promised myself that someday I'd buy a new phone with my own money. When college started, I had a two-hour daily commute. In high school, I had excelled academically and won several district-level awards. These awards were being distributed during my first year of college. One nationalized bank award finally gave me enough money for a new phone. I bought a Sony Ericsson K300i and a premium SIM card, not realizing it had been abandoned by its previous owner. By the third day, I started receiving calls for a guy named Bitsa from various financial institutions. It turned out the number previously belonged to him, and for 20 years, I've been getting these calls. Determined to keep my premium number, I began a routine of blocking wrong numbers. Back then, blocking was device-specific, so each time I got a new phone, I had to start over, keeping a list of numbers to block. I got my first job after graduating in 2009. Around 2010, I was assigned to a new project with a notorious reputation for burning people out due to a nefarious project manager named Bits. I didn't know his full name for quite a while. He took pride in making our lives a living hell. Bits ruled with an iron fist. From the moment his team stepped into the office, they were met with a barrage of emails and messages, each more urgent than the last. Bits thrived on creating chaos, often changing project deadlines on a whim demanding his team work late into the night and through weekends. Bits' presence loomed over every task. He insisted on micromanaging every detail, yet was quick to take credit for any successes, no matter how small. Failures, however, were met with his notorious tirades, publicly berating his team and assigning blame without hesitation. His unpredictable temper kept everyone on edge, afraid to make the slightest mistake. Meetings were another tool in his arsenal of torment. He scheduled them during lunch breaks and after hours, ensuring no one could escape his grasp. These meetings were often pointless, serving only to reinforce his dominance and disrupt any semblance of work-life balance his team might have had. His relentless stream of emails continued around the clock, each carrying a thinly veiled threat, perfection or dismissal. Under his reign, morale plummeted and burnout soared. Yet Bits remained oblivious, satisfied only by his complete and total control. I was quite ashamed when I learned that he was from the same area as I was and had gone to the same school, though years before me. 
In 2012, our company merged with a parent company. Almost nothing changed personnel-wise, but infrastructure-wise we got a mess outlook and an organization view. That was when I first learned about Bits from an organizational hierarchy perspective. His full name was an eye-opener, it was Bitsa. Now, the name was common enough, but at the time, mobile numbers had an area-specific pattern, so I already knew that the previous owner of my number was from the same area as me. Still, it could be someone else. I wanted to dig deeper. I talked with an old mentor who lived in the same area, and had coached several high school students for the last two decades. He confirmed my suspicions. I won't go into the details, but it was evident that Bitsa and Bits were the same person. I had been quite pissed with this unknown person named Bitsa for almost a decade by then, and Bits had been the bane of my, and several others' existence for quite some time. This is where the revenge lies. First, I unblocked all the numbers in my phone. I was getting 5 to 6 calls daily on average, but after unblocking about 150 numbers, it increased to 15 to 18. My answering strategy changed drastically. Instead of saying wrong number, I politely explained that the owner had changed his number and provided his current number to update their database. This is where I could be the idiot. I also volunteered his manager's number in case he tries something else. The fallout was epic. These people had been trying to find him for almost a decade. Banks had sold his debts to companies that harass people for a living to get their money back. It turned out, he had been taking loans in everyone's names, his wife, parents, uncles, aunts and giving everyone that same number. He was evading credit card debt and loans of upwards of 200 k dollars, equivalent in USD, but it's a crapload of money where we are from. Apparently he had almost 20 cases filed against him, but no one could find him probably why he thought he could walk on water. There are multiple versions of what happened at the office when his manager started to get calls about him. He was let go about two months later, haven't heard from him since. TLDR, previous owner of my number had duped several financial institutions. He later turned out to be my crappy boss. I informed the banks of his new number and his manager's number, leaving his career in shambles. Story 4. My relationship with my GF's mother has recently turned sour after she took my Transformer toys from my flat to give to her grandson. She has refused to give them back, saying that someone in their 20s shouldn't have toys in their flat. The issue is that they are collectibles in addition to toys. Since the majority of them date to the 1980s, their combined value is estimated to be roughly $10 to $11k. Haven't gotten them appraised but that is what I'll put down if I make the report, I informed her of their value. But she brushed it aside by stating, well, they're just toys. I even told her I'll go to the store to pick some toys for her grandson but she doesn't want that and refused by saying they don't make them like they used to. My girlfriend and I have spoken about this, but she doesn't want to become involved and prefers that I handle it on my own. I told her that I have exhausted all options and that the next logical step is probably to report the items as stolen. Stealing something worth 10k isn't a misdemeanor either, this is felony level theft. Additionally, the mother took them by entering my flat using my GF's key. My girlfriend said she would speak to her mother and ask her not to do anything similar ever again but that I should let this one go and not escalate the matter because if I reported it, we would be done. She said she would only talk and involve herself if I promised to not do anything about it and I should value our 2.5 year relationship more than some plastic toys. I don't understand why she isn't valuing our relationship and getting my stuff back from her family. I just want my things returned. I genuinely find it hard to believe she is siding with her mother. We've already been into a few arguments over this over the past several days, and I don't think things will get better. A part of me believes that her mother will likely sell them for a profit or something, and then purchase the cheaper ones for her grandson to give to him on his sixth birthday. I don't want to involve the police and ruin my relationship with my GF or her mother. Up until now, her mother has been nothing but nice to me. Is there a more effective approach to take? Advice. Relevant comments. Sure you want to be with a girlfriend who supports her mother in theft, instead of just going and taking those toys and bringing them back to you. I see what you're saying, but other than this one thing rest has been good. Here's the thing. Her mother let herself into your home to intentionally steal from you, but she's not going to say anything. She's hit taking the key back. She's not demanding the things get returned. She's doing nothing, and she will punish you if you do the one thing you have left to do. Basically, your girlfriend is helping her mom steal from you, and I'm guessing agrees with her mom about your toys. Are you sure your GF wanton in them being taken? And why is it okay for her to throw your 2.5 year relationship away so get mom can literally steal from you? 
And why would you want to preserve a relationship with someone who thinks so little of you, your feelings and your belongings? Update, I broke up with my GF because she continued to take her mom's side and threatened to break up with me. Police report has also been filed. Wrote down the estimated value to be 13k when the police asked me for it. Fingers crossed now. Some comments. Don't forget to get your lock changed. Already asked the building manager to do that. They should get changed by the end of the week. Does the theft of $10,000 plus worth of stuff increase the potential charges that the girlfriend's mom could face? Not to mention that they may become damaged while in her possession if she doesn't try to sell them. According to the police, yes. That is why they asked me to add 3k to my estimation. They would have to be appraised once retrieved though for charges to be pressed. Everything will be out of the box now. No way a kid understands value. Unless she sold them to collectors in which case she will have to pay you for them. She hasn't given them to him yet. She is waiting for his birthday which is in a few days. I suspect she won't give them to him now after knowing what they are worth and will try to sell them for profit. Update. Hello everyone. I wanted to give you an update about my Transformers collection that was stolen by my ex's mother. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to recover any of them, but we settled for 7k. This amount is definitely less than what I believe was fair, but at this point, I'm ready to move on. The past two years have been incredibly tough, and I just want to put this behind me. Thank you all for your support, it meant a lot to me when I needed it the most. Thank you so much for watching until the end. If you really like our videos, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Have a great day.